One of the earliest stories in Genesis, one which pushes the strains on marriage, is undoubtedly one of the most overlooked. It is a story between a man named Abram, soon to be known as Abraham, and his wife Sarai, or more commonly known as Sarah. The narratives between these characters are key to understanding the earliest accounts of the Bible, and feature an imperative insight into the earliest interactions in the post-flood era between man and his God. Abraham is perhaps the first character who is detailed as communion with God in this new world, one which had since flourished in the thousands of years that had passed since Noah's time. Whilst the Bible doesn't detail whether God had communed with Abram's father, which is possible, these conversations are not mentioned. In this, it can be assumed that Abram, to his credit, was the first man to speak to God in quite some time. The story here showcases the theme of faith, or the promises that God makes man, usually to both test him and to determine if he is worthy of receiving that which God has intended for him. In this case, Abram is commanded by his God to leave the comforts of his father's house in the land of Haran and to set off towards the land of Egypt. God tells Abram, in what appears to be his first interaction with the man, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household, to the land I will show you. I will make into you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, considering the possibility that God had not been very talkative in the many passings of generations between Noah and Abram, you can only imagine how sceptical Abram would have been to hearing God's voice at all. However, this is never detailed in the Bible. As far as we can tell, Abram would have likely have been raised by his father Terah with a great fear of God, and so when God called upon him, Abram didn't think twice about disobeying or even questioning what would have been a strange encounter. But furthermore, we see God promise to show Abraham a better life, and that he will acquire greatness for his name. But not only this, but that everyone else on earth would be blessed through him. So not only is Abraham guaranteed to increase his own worth by listening to God, but that everyone else on earth will also benefit from his continued obedience. So for Abraham, following God's word is a no-brainer, and there doesn't seem to be much in the way of a downside. So Abram took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, and together, with all that they had raised in Haran, journeyed to Canaan. It should also be noted here that the Bible makes a point of mentioning that Abram was 75 years old, furthermore exemplifying Abram's loyalty to his God, that even at such an age, he was still willing to make a trip in the name of the Lord. With this in mind, Abram and co arrived at the land of Canaan, it is here that God delivers a profound promise to Abram, declaring that this land would one day belong to Abram's offspring. And so as to cement his word, Abram builds an altar to God, who we are told appears before him. Abram continues to the hills east of Bethel, under God's guidance, where he proceeds to build another altar. As far as we can tell, his travels with his wife and nephew appear to be straightforward, and without the threat of any contingencies. Well other than the severe famine. The Bible tells us that the famine in the land became so intense that Abram and his companions were forced to go and live in the land of Egypt. However, upon arriving in Egypt, Abram became acutely aware of how beautiful his wife Sarai was. He began to fret over the reality that when the Egyptians, most notably the Pharaoh, laid eyes upon her, they would kill him so that they could have her. In order to prevent this, Abraham believed that if Sarai pretended to be his sister, then he would be treated fairly, and his life would be spared. The Bible tells us, As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say well my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. We'll be discussing the complications and the irregularities of this act later on, but for now, let's just assume that Abraham is a tactical genius, and that allowing his wife to be subjugated for his own safety isn't as alarming as it sounds. 
When they entered Egypt, exactly that which Abraham had foreseen came to pass. The Egyptians oogled Sarai to no end, and pretty much everyone wanted a piece of her. However, when the officials discovered her, they seized her, and took her and Abram into the pharaoh's palace. Upon seeing Sarai, the pharaoh lusted for her immediately, and the bible suggests this by the fact that the pharaoh proceeds to treat Abram well, and he gives Abram sheep, cattle, donkeys, camels, and even servants, for he believes he is Sarai's brother, not her husband. As far as Pharaoh is concerned, Sarai is fair game, and given how much he bestows upon Abram, he intends to take Sarai as his own wife, or perhaps even enter her into one of his harems. Whether or not this actually happens is not specified in the Bible, but fear not, we'll be unpicking this in a moment too. In the meantime, the Bible is quick to tell us what happens after Abram receives all the gifts from the Pharaoh, and that is that God inflicts a serious disease upon the Pharaoh and his household because of Sarai. So the Pharaoh summoned Abram and pleads with him to explain why he never told him that Sarai was his wife and not his sister. The Bible paints this conversation quite clearly as we are told, but the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say, she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? We can understand Pharaoh's confusion, and we may even have some empathy for him, given that he is punished so severely, despite not knowing what he was getting himself into. Like he professes, he had no idea he was lusting after another man's wife, because Abram had lied to him. Not only this, but he had also given Abraham more than a fair share of payment to receive what he thought was his sister, and treated him well in the process. Whilst it is never determined whether Sarai consented to the Pharaoh's advances, the fact that Abram was paid implies that she did, and that perhaps she loved Abram so much, and was so God-fearing, that she went along with it, making Pharaoh all the more forthcoming with his advances. In response to this, Pharaoh is quick to dismiss Abram and Sarai from his land, as he tells them, Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gives orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way, with his wife and everything he had. So one of the biggest debates that comes out of this story is whether or not Abram is noble or just, in essentially prostituting his own wife to ensure his own safety. Now, going by the more traditional religious approach, Abraham doesn't prostitute Sarai at all, and is in effect acting under God's guidance. In this idea, no one is being sold or traded, or even sexually taken advantage of. You'll notice the Bible doesn't actually say that Sarai slept with Pharaoh. A strong argument from doctrine is that God is testing how far Abram was willing to go to prove his faith, a test he passed with flying colours, given that he was able to sacrifice his own wife whilst maintaining full faith that God would deliver her safely. It might be added that Abram was so quick to offer up Sarai like cattle, not because he disrespected his wife, or wanted to save his own skin, but because he knew God was going to protect them. In offering up his wife, he was ensuring his own survivability, so that he could continue God's work, and God rewarded his loyalty by giving him everything that the Pharaoh did, as well as returning his wife, and sending them both on their way safely. Now, the opposing view would be that Abram is actually quite spineless. Those who are less inclined to agree with Abram's potential way of thinking see him as most certainly a selfish character, who has no regard for his wife when it comes down to his own life. It can be argued that Abram's willingness to pawn off his wife to the pharaoh so that he might survive is cowardly, and that he forces her to endure a potential rape so that he may go unharmed. Furthermore, he also reaps the rewards for this decision, as the pharaoh pays him handsomely, and this can be seen as quite miserly when you consider that Abram has no intention of coming clean about any of this until God steps in. By this argument, there are those who see Abram in this instance as a self-centered and greedy man, who is totally okay with his wife being seduced by the pharaoh so long as he is making a profit. Interestingly, what began as a means to ensure his own survival appears to quickly become a means to earn more resources, as he gains wealth. Sarai on the other hand gains, 
well, nothing. This brings me to the next great debate about this story, and that's whether Sarai actually did sleep with Pharaoh or not. Traditionalist beliefs would indicate no, and if you read the passages of the Bible, it never actually specifies whether or not they have sex. Another argument in favour of this outcome is that God punishes Pharaoh with a disease because of his intense lusting over Sarai, not because he actually had his way with her. However, you must then ask why Pharaoh would reward Abraham with cattle and servants if he hadn't gotten what he wanted. It is unspecified how long this sordid love triangle went on for, but one can assume that it went on long enough for Abraham to receive a great deal of additional benefits. Again, what manner in which Sarai served Pharaoh is unspecified. Some have theorised that she was made into his concubine, or even his wife, whilst others suggest she may have been placed into one of his harems. You'll notice that Pharaoh does refer to her as his wife, saying to Abraham after he has been cursed, Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? However, this does not determine whether he actually took her, as in, took her sexually or if he merely took her by name and ceremony. Amongst all of these ideas, the original text is too ambiguous for us to determine a certain outcome. But saying that, there are enough inferences and undertones here to suggest that something most likely did happen between Pharaoh and Sarai, enough to warrant such a severe disease upon him and his people. Of course, I suppose you might also say that whilst Abram was trying to save his own skin, whether for his own selfish need, or so that he might serve God further, Sarai is actually the real hero here. It is she who is brave enough to go along with this plan, and it is she who bears the consequences of having to have sex with Pharaoh. Despite this, Sarai is not offered the same rewards that Abraham received, and is not in the least championed by the authors of the Bible. Her sacrifice is barely even considered as a sacrifice, and to be honest, it is Abram who certainly assumes the position of the hero. Now, the other hot topic from this narrative is, was Pharaoh even wrong, and did he deserve to be punished? Again, the two sides of the argument differ immensely. On the one hand, traditional beliefs would argue that not only was it Pharaoh's lust that earned him the strict punishment from God, but also the fact that he was not a believer himself. He likely worshipped his own gods, and surely lived a life non-congruent with that of Abram's God. His willingness to take Sarai, presumably out of wedlock, and bed her out of sheer lust alone, would have made his punishment totally justifiable by this reasoning. Furthermore, Pharaoh's taking of Sarai could be interpreted as rape, given that we never hear of Sarai giving consent, and therefore, this would no doubt earn him the plight that he ends up receiving. On the other hand, it can be argued that Pharaoh was actually a stand-up dude. He saw Sarai and found her to be immensely attractive, by which after learning that Abraham was her brother and not her husband, he pursued her. Some even speculate that Pharaoh married Sarai before he slept with her, or that when he did sleep with her, his affections and desire were entirely reciprocated. So as to show his appreciations for the woman, he even went a step further and rewarded Abram with all that he gave him, proving to be not just a randy king, but one who thinks of others and seeks to offer comforts to those close to Sarai. This would give some indication that Pharaoh actually cared about Sarai, that he even bothers to recognise Abram with such honours. We even learn of how shocked he is to discover that Sarai is actually Abram's wife, declaring, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? This would imply that had he known, he wouldn't have done anything of the sort, and this attributes some honour upon the king, given his evident regret. Of course, you might also say that he only regrets his decision because he has been plagued by God, and there is no way to say whether Abram was right, and whether Pharaoh would have likely have killed him had he learned prior that Abram was her husband. In any case, Pharaoh certainly demonstrates some traits of a virtuous man, particularly his decision to let Abram and Sarai walk away. Of course, a far more crude interpretation as to why Abram opts for this non-conventional means of surviving by offering up his own wife is because, well, he's kinda into the idea of kings having their way with his wife. I mean, this isn't exactly the only instance where it happens. 
Later in Genesis 20, where the Bible tells Abram, now known as Abraham, we learn that he moves to the region of Negev, where Abimelech, the king of the land of Gerar, sends for Sarai, now known as Sarah, after learning of her beauty, and just like that, Abraham is quick to defer her as his sister. But in this instance, the Bible does specify that nothing physical had taken place between the king and Sarah. The Bible tells us that God appears to Abimelech in a dream and tells him, You are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Then we are told, Now Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, She is my sister? And didn't she say also, He is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. We learn here that Abimelech is perhaps just as virtuous in this instance as Abraham is supposed to be. Despite having taken Sarah, he had not laid a hand upon her yet, something which God later takes credit for. He also highlights his innocence, saying that his conscience and his hands are clean, for both Abraham and Sarah declared they were brother and sister. Through this, it might shed some light on the previous encounter with Pharaoh, in that Sarah was indeed willing to go through with the plan and did consent to these entanglements. God even recognises Abimelech's dilemma and states, Yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. He then tells Abimelech to give Sarah back to Abraham, lest he be killed. When Abimelech returns Sarah to Abraham, he, like Pharaoh, inquires why Abraham felt the need to lie. He asks, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you? that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom. You have done things to me that should never be done. What was your reason for doing this? Here we can see how wronged Abimelech feels in what he determines is a deception by Abraham, one that has caused him dishonour not only amongst his people, but his family too. Abimelech takes the falsehood to heart and likely feels embarrassed by the whole thing, that he'd taken Sarah, a married woman, with the intention of bedding her. Like Pharaoh, he too is stunned by the whole thing and can't seem to fathom why Abraham has done this. At least in this instance, Abraham gives an explanation as he says, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, This is how you can show me your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Once more, Abraham gives the reason that he believed he was going to be killed by these kings upon entering their land, and that by offering up Sarah under the guise of her brother, he would be spared. He then attempts to justify the entire deception by saying she actually is his sister. Well, his half-sister anyway and that because of this, he technically hasn't lied to anyone. It's interesting here how Abraham tries to make the whole endeavour sound noble and above board, sort of as if he is vindicated of the harm he has been causing because he a feared for his life and b was related to his wife by means of sharing the same father. He also adds that the whole ploy also served as a means to test how much Sarah loved him, for him to see how far she was willing to go in order to serve and save him, that she would put her own body on the line in order to ensure his safety. Abimelech proceeds to gift Abraham with cattle and slaves and grants him permission of living wherever he likes in his land. Unlike Pharaoh, he also goes the extra mile and gives Abraham a thousand shekels of silver, whilst telling Sarah that this is to cover the offences he has made against her. You'll notice that he doesn't give the shekels to Sarah, which would have been more fitting, but instead gives them to Abraham, who you might say, accepts them for her. Basically, Sarah gets an apology from Abimelech, but the whole thing is undermined given that once again, Abraham maintains full possession of the compensation. This encounter with Abimelech does shed some light on the previous encounter with Pharaoh, and throw some doubt on the idea that he and Sarah had relations. You notice that with Abimelech, God does not allow Abimelech to even touch Sarah, so it's entirely possible that this same stipulation was set upon Pharaoh, denying him in some way or form from ever being able to grasp Sarah in the way that he wanted. 
In this, Sarah remains pure, Abraham swindles the kings, and the kings end up subservient to God. Of course, if you were on the other side of the fence, you might also say that the kings added another babe to their conquests, Sarah got to experience sleeping with an actual king, and Abraham got his dark fantasies fulfilled, and also got a heck of a lot richer in the process too. Everyone sounds like a winner to me. Of course, these are just ideas put together from a multitude of different viewpoints and beliefs. Many people believe in different interpretations of biblical stories in general, not just this one, and that's one of the things I find so fascinating. It can be debated for ages whether or not Pharaoh deserved his punishment, whether or not Sarah had relations with these men, or whether or not Abraham was acting selflessly or not. Once more, the information in this video comes from a collection of different viewpoints and ideas, none of which are set in stone, nor should be considered as absolute truths. I'm sure you all have different and variant ideas as to what this story represents, as well as some of your own ideas that portray this story in new and interesting lights. So be sure to let me know what you're thinking in the comments below, and as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time.